Thank you, Cassie. That was a very generous introduction. I uh, am very happy to be here today. I have had the pleasure and the privilege to have a very strong working relationship with the CGCC, Sherry and her fine team, uh, for a number of years now. And it is my passion to be in this business. Uh, it's a little bit of a crazy business. It's very exciting. It's a little chaotic. Um, but it is a real business, and uh, when we were thinking about what kind of an opportunity might exist for me to come and speak to all of you, we thought that the holiday time was the perfect time to have a session on event planning. Uh, so, I'd like to start with just an introduction to what we'll be talking about today. So, uh, essentially, in 45 minutes or so, it's difficult to take you from starting to the complete completion of uh, the event planning process in great detail. So I pulled together a couple of highlights that I thought would be worth mentioning whether you are a very experienced event planner as a guest today or someone who's just interested in learning and knowing a little bit more about the process. So today we're going to cover the key steps in the event planning process and then a couple of other topics. The New York City labor environment was something that uh, some of you expressed some interest in hearing a little more about. Uh, pricing, everyone always wants to know about that. And then vendor relationships. And as it turns out, all of these are sort of interrelated, so there's a lot of crossover. Uh, and we'll see that as we go. But just to get started, my goal is to finish our discussion in 45 minutes. And there's a lot to cover, so let's begin. Question, what's the most important task in the event planning process? Does anyone know? Does anyone have any idea? I'll give you a quote to give you a little bit of a hint. Stubborn about your goals and flexible about your methods. Be stubborn about your goals and flexible about your methods. I do not know who came up with that, but I think it's brilliant and I use it all of the time. Establish a goal, actually multiple goals for any event. Why are we having this event? What message do we want to send to our guests and the community through this event? And the common suggestion is that you come up with a list of three to five goals. Not too many, not too few, and they usually fall into a couple of different categories. Financial goals, uh, education goals, that's one of the goals of today. Social goals, networking, making connections for people. Uh, but they are very specific to you, and you need to really give some thought to what those goals are before you proceed. Ensure your goals are SMART. Has anyone heard this acronym before? Probably. SMART, specific goals are specific, measurable, so that you can know whether you achieve them or not, achievable and realistic, and time-based. Communicate your goals to all stakeholders. Seems like common sense, but oftentimes we create these goals and then we don't share them with the rest of the people involved. And those people are your team members, anyone working on the event, your vendors, Nothing wrong with letting them know what your goals are. And even the guests in the population that you're going to be entertaining or that will be attending your event. There are ways that you can do that so that you are all unified in making this an ex a successful experience. Keep those goals front of mind throughout the planning and execution of your event. Again, it's things as simple as sending a little reminder, including it in whatever tool you're working on so that, that you are just constantly reminded of why you're doing the work you're doing all along. Yes. Now, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So now you establish your goals, and now it's time for the event planning process to begin. Let's create an event concept. Who, what, where, when, why, all of those things. Sit down with your team and think about them. Who's our audience? What, what number of guests are we thinking about? Who are our honorees, our speakers? 
what kind of event will we host? Will it be a breakfast, a lunch, a dinner, a conference, a concert, a cocktail hour? What's already been done? Now that we know our goals, we may know other events that have taken place. There's nothing wrong, and I recommend you see what's out there that has been successful and borrow from that. Where's the ideal location? Is it a hotel? Is it a restaurant? Is it in your own offices? Is it in a concert venue? Is it outside? Is it inside? When should we host the event? I was just speaking with someone about this earlier uh, in conversation. And there are definitely times of the year, certainly in the New York City environment, maybe different in other parts of the world, but um, there are seasons. The fall and the spring are the most popular times for weather and other reasons. Uh, the summer is probably the least popular time because people are vacationing, and that is pretty much across the board. And the winter is actually, I think, the biggest opportunity because it's a very good time. People are here. They're going about their business. They are more comfortable being a captive audience, and I think there is more value there. Uh, you will find that uh, you probably have uh, more influence in the negotiation process in the winter months because those tend to be the less peak times for your venues. Seek and share best practices and mistakes. Those are our biggest learning experiences, but all of the above. It's great to share experiences because that's the way that you really learn. We're going to have this session today and you're going to take some notes and, and take them back and hopefully put some of the, the items into place. But it's really good to have experiential learning and really see what has worked in reality. Brainstorm. This is something that, you know, we're talking about answering all these questions. But pure brainstorming. I attended a conference recently, and it was, it was an event planning conference. And they had lots of vendors, and I was excited to hear the speakers. And they had some forums, and one of them was on brainstorming. And I signed up for it, and I was really dreading it. I just couldn't bear the idea of having to sit with people that I don't know and come up with ideas. And the exercise that the facilitator led us through was a three-minute exercise. We all sat down at our tables of ten, and we all came up with two or three ideas based on some topic that she gave us. And we literally just put them down on Post-it notes and threw them up on a flip chart. And it was such a dynamic experience. The people at the table, I had no idea who they were, what their backgrounds were, what their levels of experience were, and we all came up with some really interesting things. And you don't know what your resources are until you actually tap into them. And it's something that we just, we shy away from it, but I highly recommend it. Sit down with your team, three to five minutes, just come up with some things, and I guarantee you'll walk away with at least one or two that you didn't come up with before. all the numbers. <laughs> Identify your budget. Not the most glamorous part of the experience, but one of the most critical. And it typically ties into one of your pre-established goals. Have you produced other comparable events in the past to give you a baseline starting point? Don't reinvent the wheel. Start from where you finished. What's your bottom line goal? Everyone should know this. And certainly, each individual is going to be delegated tasks and assignments, but everyone should know that financial goal that we were all trying to achieve. It's not a secret, and everyone should be aware of it. Identify and research major cost centers to validate the budget. That's obvious. Get approvals from authorized personnel. Never assume. So it's... Uh, it's it, Establishing a budget, especially if you've had events in the past, you kind of know what to do and you have a sense of what you're, uh, what you're doing. But you need to have approval. And I highly recommend that's something that you are comfortable with and you get buy-in from those who are authorized to, uh, to allow you to spend this money. Monitor that budget continuously throughout the process and track variances. Again, it seems pretty obvious, but we get busy in what we're doing, and we've established a budget at the beginning of the process, and that is kind of a living document, and it will ebb and flow throughout the process. 
Uh, that is acceptable, but I'm quite sure that you will need to explain what those variances are. Not only that, uh, as far as being responsible, but just as a tool for future events, you'd like to understand where those variances came to pass and be able to build in that new knowledge and information into any budget for a future event. And again, these things are all sort of intertwined. So you're establishing your budget and securing your vendors kind of at the same time. You have an idea, but now you're starting to get information from your vendors. The one thing that I'd like to really emphasize, because talking about venues and vendors is a whole conversation in and of itself, and we're going to stick to 45 minutes today, uh, but your contract, that's, um, that's really what it's all about. Ultimately, you're going to be making arrangements, having uh, tastings and samplings and uh, looking at pictures of things and, and making decisions. But when you finally enter into that contract, read it. Even if you've worked with that vendor before, things change over time. I worked on the vendor side of things and our contracts changed every year just a little bit. If you don't understand something, ask questions. Do not be shy. Do not think that you are a bother. Your vendor expects that you will ask those questions. And if you don't, they assume that you understand everything and know as much as they do. And that is your responsibility to really own that process. Expedite revisions by sharing any must-haves up front. So what often happens in the process is you make a decision or at least a preliminary decision. You ask for a contract or a proposal. You get it. It takes time to prepare that. And then you remember, oh, wait, I forgot. I need to have, uh, I need to have the servers at that restaurant dressed in a blue uh, uniform. Those are things that you really should know and your vendors should know ahead of time so that they can address that and keep that process moving smoothly. And then include pricing in your contract and understand your minimums. It seems, again, very obvious, but oftentimes a contract is more of a general document because you may not have all of the final details outlined at the point when you enlist that vendor or that venue. Uh, but even minimums can be established, and that protects you in the case of changes in attendance or cancellation or whatever the case may be. You don't need to worry about those things because your vendors are really um, eager to satisfy you, and they're not eager to impose a cancellation uh, clause on you. They will try to work with you to the best of their ability to make things happen regardless of what the letter of the contract is. But just in a world of uncertainties, you should always establish that contract with that information from the beginning. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. So a little bit about some of the tools that are out there right now. Identify your event management tools and your staffing resources. Learn about and choose from the latest and best collaborative uh, event planning tools. There are so many out there right now. A couple of my favorites, <clears throat> Eventbrite, Social Tables. Uh, Check in Tech is actually a service that uh, is provided for registration. They're a service provider. And then there are just, there are more than I can count. Google Sheets, Smartsheet, Bizabo, Asana, Basecamp, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> And then I'm going to give you a WeChat caveat. Uh, WeChat's a great tool as well. Uh, it is still emerging uh, in the United States. So I know that I have tried to use it and I, my brain is just wired for other tools because I've used them for so long. So if that is a tool that is really indispensable for you, just know that you're probably going to need to educate some of your user, users probably well in advance of the time that you'd like them to use it. I know it is a, a very popular tool, so I just wanted to mention that because I know that I've encountered that in the past. Um, keep it simple. There are lots of tools, as we all probably know, but pick one or two that are the most uh, versatile, the ones that you are the most comfortable using, 
and ensure that everyone is trained and using the tool of choice, including your vendors. And I underline collaborative because most of the uh, project and event management tools that are out there now are uh, replacing things like Excel and uh, just Microsoft Word documents because they're collaborative. You can invite people to share them and you can invite them at different levels of security, just viewing, viewing and editing, etc. So that you're all working from one plan, that living document is moving forward, there's never an outdated version. And then as far as the staffing resources go, identify your team uh, and begin to delegate task ownership as a part of this, again, this living process as you're coming up with whatever your tools are going to be and you're starting to pull together your plan, you're assigning these tasks as time uh, passes. And timing is everything. Establishing your timeline of key tasks and deadlines. This is that master document that you're going to be using one of those tools to orchestrate. Start with a draft very early in the process and then of course update it continuously. Assign ownership to every single task. Then this is something I'm, I'm sure, again, it's a lot of common sense. Schedule time once a week to review the current version of the timeline. Now you're in that uh, that document, uh, that plan, every day, adding little things, tweaking little things, moving things around. But I, uh, one of my recommendations and something that I, I actually schedule in my calendar is once a week, whether I have any edits or not, on a Friday or a Monday typically, take out the document and look at it in its entirety, beginning to end because you will have a different perspective than if you're just editing it. If you're looking at it to see if it makes sense with a sort of fresh set of eyes, uh, that will probably also yield some, some edits. At the same time, you know, you have two different timelines. You've got a master timeline of everything that leads up to the event, and then you have your, essentially your day of, which is a very uh, detailed, almost minute by minute, and uh, ROS, of course, is run of show, if you haven't heard that expression before. Uh, those two documents are obviously interrelated, but it's a good idea to, sort of to get that started and you can see that uh, build over time and massage it as needed. And build in time for the unexpected. That's probably one of the biggest lessons that I can leave you with for today. It's, uh, we never think that things are going to change. We never think we're going to have an emergency. And there's always something. And that's a good example. That's me in the middle. I met Old Navy a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I was hired for the day uh, by an event plan, another event planner that I work with, to be with her for exactly that purpose. If I did nothing more than just walked around and check things and maybe double check things, then that would have been my job. But I was there for the purpose of dealing with that thing that she had no idea was coming. And as it turned out, that thing was that the bride had ordered 100 pair of ballet slippers so that when they were dancing on the dance floor later that night, all of the ladies could take their heels off and put the ballet slippers on. It's very popular now, people like to do that. Uh, they were super cute, she picked them out herself. And they ended up in Ohio. <laughs> and we learned about that about three hours before the event. So, she had planned for the unexpected, and she had me there. So I went to Old Navy and found 100 pair of ballet slippers. And that's me with my new friends at Old Navy. <laughs> <laughs> but you really can't discount that. You, something will happen. And if nothing happens, then you won the lottery. But likely it will be something. It probably won't be that major, or maybe it will be really major, but you will be prepared because you anticipated resources toward that end. Invitation Again, we're not going to go into great detail about this, but I just wanted to touch base on a couple of sort of industry standards. Your save the date, typically five to six months in advance, usually electronic, 
I would say the majority of the time. Uh, and certainly once the date and venue are confirmed and contracted. I, I've, I've worked with a number of clients over the years that suddenly had a change and uh, they weren't yet contracted with the venue and either we had a misunderstanding or there was some change and they had already communicated everything to uh, their guests at Save the Date. It's not the end of the world, it's still very far in advance, but it's uncomfortable to have to take that information back with your audience, so uh, always wait until you've confirmed your date and your venue. The invitation, six to eight weeks in advance, is kind of an industry standard. Of course, that's all over the map. If you're planning an event for next week, that's obviously not going to work, uh, but we're talking in general about events in advance. Uh, and then time your RSVP RSVP date to allow for vendor deadlines. Sometimes we forget about that, but your hotel, your caterer, your AV professional, all of these people are likely engaging with other rental companies and so on and so forth. So they have deadlines for information from you. Uh, and obviously you want to know how many guests are attending the event and what the sort of final landscape is before those deadlines are due. And then a reminder, this seems to be a very popular new standard, uh, sending an electronic reminder to your guests in advance. It allows you to just kind of get back on their radar. We're competing with so much stimuli in today's world. Uh, and then share any last minute things that you may, you may not have had an entertainer confirmed or a guest speaker or it may have changed. This allows you to both remind them and excite them about the upcoming event. And then there's the event. I'm not going to talk about the event in great detail. Just a couple of things that I think are really, uh, are often missed because things are rolling along so quickly. And one of them is having a pre-game roundup or a, a team meeting. Seems like everybody is on the same page. We've got a great plan, but everyone has their own little mini priorities. So it really is time well spent not only to sort of round everyone up and get them all on the same page, but I think it eliminates stress for people to just come together and let them understand that we're all thinking about the same things and we're ready and, get, and also to get them excited about what's, what's to come. And then one of the, I think, most important things about that, that day of is ensuring that you have a plan for a common line of communication throughout the day uh, and the event and test it. Again, this sort of uh, harkens back to the conversation about WeChat, whether it's WeChat or uh, an email group or whatever tool you decide to use, make sure that everyone is ready to use it and knows how to use it. And then we're jumping already to after the event, uh, post-event feedback, lessons learned, and final budget review. Again, not very glamorous, and we're tired now. We don't necessarily want to sit down and talk about how things went. went. Uh, often forgotten, one of the most critical steps in the process. It's most likely, uh, it, it's likely actually, that you will probably host another event after this event may not be tomorrow, maybe next year, it may not be the same event, but it might be similar, it might be completely different. But a lot of the lessons that you will learn from this experience are transferable to just about anything. Invaluable lessons to be captured while they're fresh. You will be, and I'm sure you've experienced this, amazed at how much you forget in even a week. It was so fresh and so sometimes painful for you to go through an experience but it just goes away because there are so many other things that take its place and then you move on and you've lost those really valuable lessons. And then assessing and sharing the results, how you did with regard to your goal achievement with your team. It's a great opportunity for growth and team building and recognition. It's not just about this thing, you, this party we had, we had some guests, we, we achieved our goals, but your team made that happen. And maybe your team made a few mistakes. 
And there's nothing wrong with that because once you uh, once you eliminate the um, freedom to make those valuable learning mistakes, uh, you stop the learning process. So it's great to sort of have that opportunity to reflect and then to thank everyone. So we're going to move on to a couple of other topics. But does anyone have any questions at this point? about some of the key tasks in the event planning process. Anything that wasn't covered that you were thinking, hmm, I'd love to ask a question about that. This won't be the last time if you need it. So related topics of interest. These are some things that uh, were shared that uh, all of you wanted to hear a little more about, the New York City labor environment, uh, pricing, and vendor relationships. So starting with the New York City labor environment, I was really thinking about this, and I wasn't exactly, this is just a big topic. Um, uh, I'm not here to give you my editorial uh, comments. I'd like to give you a little bit of information and maybe some best practices. So a little bit of history on how uh, the labor movement sort of took shape. Uh, back in the 19, uh, I'm sorry, back in the 1850s, labor started to uh, organize, not formally uh, with a union, but, um, but sort of coming together. It was actually sort of secretly in the beginning uh, during the Industrial Revolution when the ranks of labor were growing so dramatically and so quickly. And then fast forward about 75 years in the 1930s, the Great Depression and some other political factors that increased labor union popularity. Then in 1935, some federal legislation was passed that made it easier for unions or made it possible and uh, a requirement that business allow unions to form and, uh, and also uh, put into place collective bargaining agreements. Then in 1947, some more federal legislation that sort of uh, balanced the scales a little bit more. Uh, and limited unions from uh, political contributions and strikes because they were using that, uh, that economic power to, uh, uh, to their advantage uh, and probably a little bit uh, out of balance. And then just fast forward, uh, obviously a lot has happened since then and as of 2013, uh, uh, just to give you uh, a, a point of reference, only about 7% of the private sector workforce is actually unionized. I don't know if you knew that. And that membership is actually down fairly significantly from uh, about 17% in 1983. That's about 30 years. Uh, and probably as a result of the global economy. And I'm sure that you see that in your respective businesses. Um, and that continues to be a factor in how, uh, in how uh, uh, unions organize their, uh, their members. So some tips for navigating the landscape. Know what kind of environment in which you're working. So in New York City, uh, the majority of the venues and uh, technical vendors have uh, some sort of, of union component uh, as a part of their, their team member populations. Um, hold your venue and your venue, vendor partners responsible for explaining the rules and any boundaries in advance to allow you to plan and budget accordingly. There are rules, just like any business environment, and some of them are contractual, so they will affect what you can and can't do. Ensure that the rules are not in conflict with any of your objectives or your goals. It's very rare that there would be something that is a boundary or uh, it, that is prohibited that would really completely not allow you to meet your goal. So you do need to accept reasonable limitations. And that's something that, uh, of course, you'll communicate with your representative and decide what that is. Uh, but. Always expect quality service, respect, and professionalism regardless. Any questions about that? Pricing. Seems pretty obvious, but we get busy and we get comfortable 
especially if we've worked with vendors or venues in the past. Uh, but I highly recommend that you get into and comfortable with the process of always looking for what else is out there. Even if it's just to check the hypothesis that you're getting the best value with someone that you've worked with for a long time. And it keeps us, as vendors, keeps us on our toes when we know that we have a little bit of competition. It's kind of like ding ding a little bit. Um, compare apples to apples. When you do have multiple proposals, make sure that you're looking at exactly the same thing from each. So one vendor may say it's $100 per person. The other may say it's $75 per person. That's a pretty, percentage-wise, pretty big difference. The first vendor may have included the ancillary costs. The second may not have. So you just want to understand what you're comparing. And be transparent. If you only have $10 to spend, and your vendor is most likely going to send you a proposal for $100, that's a waste of your time and, and their time. So give them what your boundaries are up front. They will appreciate that. Know your budget, obviously, when it comes to pricing. Know your budget. Ask for detailed and comprehensive estimated pricing at the point of contract. Again, things are going to change. You're going to make the detailed arrangements at, over time after you've actually contracted. But you can certainly get a, an estimate of what it is at this point in time under these circumstances so that you have that as a starting point. Ensure that all ancillary costs are outlined up front. We just talked about that. And expect your vendors to stay within budget and ask them to clearly identify any add-ons along the way before they are confirmed. Again, this is not because your vendors are uh, trying to do something that they think you won't notice. They move along quickly and may assume that you are aware that if you're adding something that it's going to add cost. As a customer, I might assume that if I'm adding something and you don't tell me it costs more, it doesn't cost me anything. Both of those assumptions are probably incorrect, so it just always helps to ask. Ask vendors for suggestions to help reduce costs. This is something that I was always surprised about uh, during my years at, at the Waldorf, that people didn't ask. I would make suggestions and, the, and my clients would be very grateful, but they never asked me, what are your ideas? What have other people done? Where can I maybe uh, make a change that won't really affect the quality of the event, but will certainly affect my bottom line? Um, I, I write piggyback in here, and it's, I don't even think that's an industry term. I think that's a Tracy term. But uh, there is a dynamic in any environment. If, uh, if you are doing the same thing over and over and over again, there's obviously a cost advantage through economy of scale. Ask your vendors. You know, are you serving, like, and I, I always come back to the catering side of things because that's my comfort zone, but are you serving uh, beef to anyone else? Is there a way that I could piggyback or copy their menu so that maybe there's some cost advantage to me as well? Um, eliminating unnecessary items. Does everyone need a bread roll? Maybe not. That might save me a dollar per person. It's not very much, but it's every little bit helps. Oh. And then trust but verify. Uh, I always recommend that you compare all of your final arrangements to what was in your contract originally. Because again, going back to that, uh, that point about asking your vendors to clearly articulate whenever you're adding any additional items that may bring additional costs that's going to affect the accuracy of your final budget, you want to know about that. And again, no one's trying to deceive anyone, but things are moving quickly and they may forget a conversation they had in the beginning, so it's always a good exercise to go back and compare. And then vendor relationships. You're going to, again, there's a lot of overlap here. Uh, the labor market, how you negotiate pricing, and then ultimately, the relationships that you establish with your vendor partners um, set clear and achievable expectations together. Again, it seems very obvious, but ask for a list of key deliverable items 
in a clear outline to allow you to set calendar reminders. So you, your contract is full of deadlines and requirements, but there's a lot of fine print. It can sometimes be a very confusing document. A lot of them are developed at the corporate level and they may not be that user friendly. Ask your professional to help you with that. I'm sure they've been asked before and I'm quite sure that they know the top five or ten items that you'll need to ha be aware of. Ask your vendor for their top three. And when I say that, I'm not talking about uh, necessarily contract requirements, although they could be. But what their top three items are that you can help them with. It might just be getting them a floor plan on time. I know that was definitely in my top three. Because there are, uh, there are things that you're not aware of on their side of the equation that depend on the information that you share with them. And that one was a very hot topic and I always needed it and I always struggled with it because you always struggled with it because people were changing at the last minute and you could never give us information. I understand. But it would be on my top three and, and there are other items that will vary by vendor. Um, meet and exceed payment requirements. I know that seems, again, very obvious, but uh, that's something that uh, your professionals, your partners will be will not want to discuss with you. They want to serve you, but at the end of the day, they're running a business and they need, they, they need to be, be paid for their services. And, uh, and it always helps. I always loved my clients who beat me to the call. Communicate. I put it in caps. It's pretty obvious. And a lot of this is about communication, as you can see efficiently and effectively, with an emphasis on efficiently. Uh, be mindful of your vendor partner's over-leveraged schedules. Your schedules are certainly over-leveraged, I am quite sure about that. If you think about uh, some of your vendors, they have many of you, and they have all of the steps in the process for many of you, and many of them are not only charged with planning and administering and organizing and orchestrating and executing, they're also charged with a sales agenda. So they need to book business if they have a job to do, and they have a job to do. So just being mindful of the fact that they have very full schedules and they don't want to tell you that, because that's a dirty little secret, but um, it's good for you to be aware uh, and you can help them with that by trying to limit uh, your revision requests. Everyone has their own sort of uh, level of expectation for uh, the information that they're working with. Some people can work with a marked up copy right up until the end and they're comfortable with that. Other people have approvals to get with their uh, senior leadership team and it needs to be very refined and accurate, perfect every time and things are changing all the time so to revise documents continuously does take a lot of time. If you can limit that, I am quite sure your vendors will value that in your relationship. Uh, meet and exceed information deadlines, back to that floor plan. See that uh, menus, floor plan, timeline, etc. Anything that they need in order to execute the event on your behalf uh, is helpful. And make efforts to prevent last-minute or completely unexpected changes and requests. Again, this is a living process, and there are so many things that even if you are the best planner, you wouldn't have expected that. Uh, Sherry would sell 10 more tables to the Bank of China the night before the event, but it can happen. And those are the things that obviously there's no way you can control, but everything else, you can. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> That's, uh, again, when dealing with vendor relationships, they're not, they're not machines, they're people. And they're in a business that is a t most likely a 24-hour business, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and your satisfaction is, makes them happy. That's what makes me happy. That's why I'm in this business. I love to see the satisfaction of one of my clients. They, everything went essentially according to plan. 
they're getting the accolades they need, they met their budget, they're happy. Tell your vendors that will build loyalty with them. They will be so committed to you. They will want you back again. And even though you're the one with the power of choice, it's a two-way street. And they can serve you in ways that you would never imagine with those things that just come up along the way if you really value and work toward a, a really strong relationship. A couple of final thoughts. This is the shameless self-promotion part of the, uh, of the presentation. <laughs> Consider the benefits of hiring a good event professional. Event planning is not rocket science. It's, it's actually something any of us can do. It's very time consuming. There's a lot of detail. You have a lot of uh, diplomacy required. You need to be able to make decisions very quickly. You need to manage people and stress very well. And that's not for everyone. Even though you can actually do the tasking, the dynamic is something that is maybe not for you. Um, planners are available for full and limited service assistance. You don't always have the budget for that. In which case, sometimes hourly consulting can just sort of give you some really high value touch points that will allow your team resources to uh, function a little more smoothly. A couple of specific areas, just for a little food for thought. Uh, contract review and negotiation. Before you sign on the dotted line, isn't it a good idea to have someone that really knows and who has negotiated and can negotiate on your behalf and then you don't have to have that really uncomfortable conversation with your vendor partner? I think that's a really good value. Uh, timeline and run of show design. Certainly, as a first time out, if you're hosting an event and this is all new for you, that's an area that may be really scary and unfamiliar and you could get some, probably some, some significant value. Um, and then registration, day of management assistance. There's so many people out there, great freelancers that have been in the business for a really long time and some established event planning uh, firms that will just come on the day of. You may just need someone to sort of bring it all together. And usually in that case, if you are uh, enlisting someone's services, it really isn't day of, it's usually a week of because you need to sort of educate them and, and identify any landmines that might be out there. But um, I think that's a really good value as well. And then always expect the best, but have a solid plan for the rest. And that's, that concludes my uh, event planning tips for today. And I really thank you for your attention and for allowing me to come and speak with you today. And uh, if you have any questions afterward, I will be here to, uh, to speak with you. Thank you very much.